guys and welcome back to my channel. The case that I'm going to be looking into today is the brutal murder of Suzanne Kappa. Now she was a young 16 year old girl who was actually murdered by the people that she thought were her friends. This was a suggested case so thank you for that. I appreciate any suggestions you guys have. I just like to let you know I mean no disrespect whatsoever to anyone that I talk about today. I just gathered this information from the internet to compile into a video for educational purposes. I also wanted to put in a warning here because this case is brutal. It's it features torture, murder, it is what happened to Suzanne was just horrific and it may not be a video for you. So I just wanted to put that out there before I get into it and obviously if it's not the kind of video that you would want to watch, then just try one of my other videos. Suzanne Jane Capper was born in 1976 in Greater Manchester in England. She lived with her mother, Elizabeth Capper. She also lived with her stepfather, John Capper, and she had an older sister called Michelle. Now, Michelle and Suzanne didn't know who their father was, I believe, from a very young age. He walked out on them or something along those lines, and they never knew who he was, and to this day, it's still not known nothing is known about him. The only father that they ever knew was John. In the 1990s, however, the her, their parents split up. So John and Elizabeth, they were having a lot of bitter arguments and so they decided that they were gonna split up. But that took a toll on both of the children, especially Suzanne. They both did decide to live with John, their stepdad, and Again, they had a really troubled time with it. At the time, Suzanne was going to Moston High School and she began truant in. In her final two years, her attendance and her grades were erratic and insufficient at best. But again, she found it really, really difficult. She was going through such a hard time. And so the thing that suffered was her grades. But otherwise, she was this sweet, lovely, well-natured girl. She was always very kind, well, well-mannered, and she was always in high spirits. She was a genuine, very well-liked person. However, she was also easily influenced and easily persuaded. In late 1992, as I said, struggling with all these things that had happened, she began associating with questionable people. One of those people was Jean Powell. She was a 26-year-old mother of three. She lived on 97 Langworthy Road in Moston in a small Victorian terrace and her house was very well known in the neighbourhood, let's just say that, because out of that home she used to sell drugs and stolen cars. Now that's what she did to pay her bills to provide for her kids and obviously it's criminal but that is how she made her way in life and as you can imagine selling drugs and things puts a lot of questionable people in her home. The thing was, was that Suzanne actually knew her because she used to babysit for her three children when she was 10 years old, up for about six years, I believe. So she knew her, she was familiar and she thought she was a nice woman. It was said that all Suzanne ever wanted in life was to feel loved and to feel accepted and to just make friends. And so this relationship with Jean was an easy relationship for her because she already knew her. She'd already been building a rapport with her over these years and with her children and they had a relationship and so it came easy to her because of that. She began spending more and more time there and it was may have been to get away from family drama or something like that, I don't know, but she practically spent all her time there. Again, Jean's vocation was to sell drugs and the cars, but she seemed like she was a positive influence on Suzanne and Jean was just a family friend to the Cappers. Both sisters would spend time around there, both of them knew that, knew her, and even Michelle actually lived with her for a time. She rented a room out of her house, but then in August of 1992, she decided that she was going to move out because she didn't like people coming in and out, and who can blame her? They were coming for drugs or stolen cars, and so they would have been in and out all the time to obviously buy these amphetamines, and she didn't like it. But not only that, she didn't like the new friends that Jean was associating herself with. And apparently some of them had actually tried to push themselves on Michelle and obviously get physical with her and she wasn't putting up with it, she left. The main of her friends that was questionable was Bernadette McNeely and she had recently moved in three doors down to the house of 91 and whether they associated, like got 
friends because of the drug dealing or whether they'd just seen each other passing obviously they live close I don't know but whatever the reason they did become friends and she started going around a lot she started going around that much that she actually moved in with her so she had three kids of her own bearing in mind she had I don't understand that really she left her own house empty and then took her three kids into Jean Powell's home who had also three kids so that ended up with two women sleeping in that house with six children and there weren't enough bedrooms to the point where Jean and Bernadette actually had to sleep in the dining room on a mattress together because all of the people that used to come around would say that the rooms were filled with children. Bernadette was also known as Bernie so that's what I'm going to call her throughout this video but as I said Suzanne stayed around a lot too so you've got Bernie with all the kids, you've got Jean with all her kids and then you've got Suzanne staying around a lot along with a lot of other people. It seemed like Jean's house was kind of a docile in a sense, Pe that's why people used it. There was no room for Suzanne so everyone just kind of cramped in there. And she did pretty much move in after that and it was said according to Michelle that Bernie would often bully Suzanne along with Jean and Suzanne just took it. She never seemed scared of them. Even though they bullied her, she still stayed regularly. Suzanne was really nice and kind and she wanted these women to be her friends. And so she would cater to their every whim. She would pamper them and do whatever they wanted her to, no matter how insane it may have seemed. I have read as well in late 1992, Suzanne actually turned up at her mother's house, Elizabeth, and Jean and Bernie had beaten her up. She turned up at the house asking for help, asking to come in, if she could stay there and Elizabeth, worried that it would ruin her relationship with her new boyfriend, turned her away and wouldn't let her in. And that decision would haunt Elizabeth for the rest of her life. Despite the friendship being very abusive, Suzanne did find it really difficult to leave. The reality possibly being that she couldn't and she felt like she had nowhere to go. I'm just gonna introduce a few names here. It can get a bit confusing in this case. Like when I was searching it up, and researching into it I got a bit muddled up with the names because there's that many of them like there's that many people involved in this case so I'm going to introduce a few names here and I hope it doesn't confuse anyone so Jean Powell did have a husband called Glyn Powell and they were separated they were no longer together but he used to come around all the time they were still really really friendly so you've got Jean and you've got Glyn then we have Bernie who I've already mentioned she was 24 years old and she was dating a guy called Anthony Dodson, who was 16 years old. So not only was Anthony in a sexual relationship with Bernie, he was also in a sexual relationship with Jean. So you've got like two milfs, I guess, and one young lad, and it doesn't even stop there because there's just a lot of kind of that thing going on in this house. So as I said, Jean was having sexual relations with Anthony and she was also having sexual relations with a man called Jeffrey Lee who was a client of hers and who frequented a house to buy amphetamines. Then you have Clif Clifford Pook who is Jean's younger brother. Obviously it was her brother so he would go around a lot. He, he was a frequent flyer at that house too. So you have these six main people that would go around to a house a lot, often stay around a lot, often spend a lot of time with each other and let's just say they weren't very nice people. You've got Jean, Glyn, Bernie, Anthony, Jeffrey, and Clifford. So as you know, those people were the ones that were involved in Suzanne's case and they harmed her. Now, the reasons that they gave for harming her were just utterly ridiculous. So the motives, I guess, as to what they said, as to why they did it. And this is what they actually told the police. Like, seriously, it's no lies. So initially, Bernie accused Suzanne of stealing her pink duffel coat, which apparently was quite expensive. She saw her use it and then it went missing. This was unproven, just like all the other things I'm about to say, they were all unproven. Jean claimed that Suzanne went on to speak to this man and Suzanne told him that Jean would sleep with him if he paid her to do it and that she was kind of trying to force her to do so and offer out services that she wasn't willing to give, I guess, for money. Again, it was never proven, so we don't know whether Suzanne would have done something like that. She seemed like a really sweet-natured, kind-hearted girl, so I don't know. Then in November of 1992, both Bernie and Anthony got pubic lice and they blamed Suzanne because they all slept 
in kind of that single mattress. Everyone would have to use that single mattress. And so Suzanne slept in it one night and then they slept in it the next night. Obviously had intercourse or however it went down and then they both had lice and so they blamed her. Again, unproven. Either way, both the pair had to shave their pubic hair off to try and get rid of these lice and they blame Suzanne for that. But I did find as well that Anthony later said to Jean, I believe he confesses to Jean, that Bernie, he thinks Bernie was actually the one that gave him the lice, but Bernie was having none of that. She wouldn't accept it. Whether she was embarrassed, I don't know, but for her, it was easier to put the blame on Suzanne. So those were the three main reasons as to why these people hurt poor Suzanne. It's just unbelievable. Like when I looked into this case, I, I couldn't believe that they were claiming that that is why they tortured and murdered her. For such trivial reasons that may not have even been Suzanne, it was all kind of word of mouth and they were all just blaming her. It's more likely that they were just trying to come up with these things just to hurt her. Like they had the intentions all along. She was impressionable and they were evil people. And it doesn't sound like from what I have read of Suzanne to do things like that. So again, come to your own decisions on that, but there you go. Just seems to me at least it's something that she wouldn't do, but obviously I don't know Suzanne. All I can do is find the information out about her on the internet that's portrayed and then go with that. On the 7th of December in 1992, Jean lured out Suzanne out of her stepfather's house, John's house, and she wanted her to come round because she told her that there was this guy that she had a crush on and he was waiting at her house to tell her something special. It was all a ploy. There was not Suzanne's crush waiting for her at Jean's house. Instead, it was just the gang waiting for her. But Suzanne believed them, why would she not? These were her friends, she trusted them. And so she went to Jean's house where Glyn Powell and Anthony Dodson were lying in wait for her. As soon as she stepped inside the house, they just jumped on her. Glyn held her down, he shaved her head, he shaved her eyebrows, and then he, they forced her to clean up the mess. Glyn then pl put a plastic bag over her head, sealed it, and as she's stumbling around, not knowing where she's going, struggling probably to breathe at this point because the air would have been getting thin in there. They just begin hitting her whole over the head, taking turns at it. They also apparently hit her in the genital area too with just with basic household objects that they could find lying around. At one point she ends up on the floor. She's curled up in a defensive position and that's when Bernie and Jean chime in. They begin to repeatedly kick her, punch her, hit her with wooden utensils that they find around the kitchen and they just sort of batter her. The entire group soon join in and they begin hitting her with objects and including a leather belt. All the while they're laughing and they're yelling curses at her, they find it hilarious of what they're doing. The beatings were so bad that eventually her left arm just lay motionless by her side so it was either dislocated or broken in the cruel battering that she received. She was then taken to the bathroom and forced to shave off her own pubic hair as apparently comeuppance for them having to shave theirs, even though seemingly it was from Bernie and not even Suzanne. Not that that's any excuse anyway. She was then forced to clean that up too. Jean then locked her in a cupboard overnight. Now, Jean's excuse for locking her in the cupboard overnight was apparently so that the others couldn't torment her more and it was to keep her away from the group, kind of protecting her. But then she takes her from that cupboard brings her to one upstairs and locks her in that and then eventually they take her out and torture her more so I don't even believe that that was Jean's intention it was probably just to try and lessen her sentence or something like that. On the 8th of December in 1992 Suzanne was taken out of the cupboard and she was transferred to Bernie's abandoned house. This was because they were worried that the kids were getting frightened by her crying all night. More than likely that her cries might have been heard by neighbours, something like that and they were worried about that, I don't know. The next scenes are like something out of a horror film. They tie her up on an upturned bed with electrical cable and they force her into a spread eagle position. Now I don't know if you know what that is. It's where your arms are kind of up in a Y shape and your legs mirror the image. They're in the same kind of way. So she wasn't able to really move very much at all. She was kept in a back room and then Jeffrey and Clifford come up to the house. They see a naked Suzanne tied to the bed, blindfolded, gagged, bruised and pounded with her head all shaved off and they don't do anything about it. They don't try and get help. They don't try and help her. They just join in. Over the next five days, she was subject 
subjected to horrific torture which would become more brutal as more time passed. Bernie was said to have recorded herself saying the words, Hi, I'm Chucky, wanna play? Obviously that's a phrase from one of the Chucky movies, if you don't know. And she would play this over and over. Hi, I'm Chucky, wanna play? She put on earphones on Sue's hand's head, duct tape them to her head, and would blast this phrase full volume along with rave music. And in particular, a vinyl by 150 volts named, Hi, I'm Chucky, wanna play? which features samples from the movie Child's Play. This was released in October of 1992, so it would have only been a couple of months old at the time. Now I searched this song up and I listened to it, and I don't mean to sound disrespectful to obviously the people that created it, because I'm not that kind of person, but I listened to it and after, I don't know, a minute, it literally drove me insane and I had to turn it off. I couldn't listen to any more of it, it was driving me nutty and my heart broke for poor Suzanne because she had to listen to that on full volume. She had no choice and it was repeated over and over for hours on end. And it was upsetting to think that I could turn it off like I did, but she couldn't. Eventually it haunted her. Bernie would even commence torture sessions with the phrase, Chucky's coming to play. And it would terrify Suzanne. She would scream at the sheer sound of those words because she knew what was coming, she knew what torture would follow and it terrified her and it's just awful to even think about it. That poor, poor girl. She was beaten, pinched, kicked, she was screaming in pain initially all night and to curb this they started injecting her with amphetamines regularly. They injected her also quite often with a drug called Adderall and that is to help improve focus and reduce impulsivity because it increases dopamine levels in the brain. Now they wanted her to be alert and focused 24 seven, basically so that she didn't get any chance of escape. So if you're you're asleep, I guess in their eyes, she's escaping the torture for a little bit. She's getting a break and they didn't want that. They didn't want her to sleep because they didn't want her to escape any of this torture. And so they would inject her with the drugs to keep her awake. And it's just <sighs> horrific. I want to just put in another one in here. This section is kind of especially brutal. So again, if you want to stick with the story, then please do. If not, I'm just giving you another way to get out before it gets, I guess, too brutal. So they would burn her skin. They would burn it with lighters and cigarettes. And they would often rub a mixture of chili powder salt and pepper onto her genital areas and then they would invite the guys to sexually assault her while she screamed out in pain. The main people involved in this were Jean, Bernie, Anthony and Glyn. But as I said before, at some point during the week, Jeffrey and Clifford were shown Suzanne. As the days passed, she would be unconscious a lot of the time. And of course, she would be surrounded in her own urine and feces. They didn't let her get up to go to the toilet. So she just did it where she was, which obviously, began to smell, of course it would, and that really angered Bernie because this was her home and Suzanne was soiling it and making it dirty and she didn't like it. So the group decided that they were going to untie her and give her a bath. They chucked her in a bath with concentrated disinfectant and they got this really, really stiff bristle yard brush in a sense. I believe it was plastic bristles and they began scrubbing her. Now, this is even more horrific because they scrubbed her chest and her back until her skin began peeling off and she was just left red raw. They took her back to the bed and then they tied her up once more. This was when, according to Anthony, Jean's brother Clifford, untied her, took off a gag and told her to open her mouth. He said, right, I'm going to rip your teeth out. He began smashing her teeth with pliers, trying to loosen them, I guess, so that he could rip them out of her mouth. He took a hold and he pulled, but all it really did was chip and snap. It didn't actually come out. He then hit them a few more times, put them on again and pulled really, really hard with such force that her her head was pulled forward with it. And again, the force was that strong that when he heard a crack and it had pulled out, she went flying backwards. She went flying backwards into the mattress and hit her head on the mattress. He did the same again and he was just laughing about it. He plucked out two of her teeth in total, I believe, which the police later found around at his apartment, like some sort of sick trophy. Whilst all this went on, there was an instance which she could have been saved. Obviously, initially, if Jeffrey and Clifford weren't evil, then they could have 
obviously saved her. But there was another instance. A guy named David Hall, who was actually 18 years old at the time, I don't know whether he knew Jean because he bought drugs of her, stolen car, I don't know how he knew her, but he goes around and they need him to house sit in a sense because they plan on going out a bit later on. It was Jeffrey and Anthony who was going to step out to help somebody. So whilst he's there, he hears Anthony shout, shut up you slag, coming from the back room. And he's curious, so he asks what's going on and Anthony brings him to the back room and shows him to his arm. He says that it's a biology project or something like that. David said that she had a cloth over her face from just above the eyebrows and covering her nose. She had bits of dried blood, blood all over her body and her upper body looked like a skinned chicken and that she had no hair at all. Later on, he was actually left alone in the house with Susan who pleaded with him to untie her. He confessed, she asked me if I could help but I told her I couldn't. I asked who she was, she said her name was Suzanne. She asked me if I could untie her, I said I couldn't do anything. He later claimed that he was too afraid of Jeffrey to untie her, raise the alarm, let her go. He said, I thought they would pound me if I said anything. They'd have got me, wouldn't they? I didn't know what to do, I was too shocked to do anything. And honestly, I think that's a load of crap myself. He could have done something. He was alone in that house with Suzanne. He could have gone down there, he could have untied her. And Suzanne would have done the rest. She would have ran. She would have ran straight out of the house. She would have never looked back. She would have gone to the police, reported them, and then they would have been arrested. And then David could have obviously gone into, I don't know, like a protection thing where the police protected him. There were ways around it. And I get if people are feared of people, but her life was at risk. He should have done something and he just didn't. And because he chose not to act, Suzanne suffered the ultimate prize for it. I'm not in any way blaming David because he didn't do this, they did, but it just makes me really sad that he could have let her out and he didn't and then she ended up losing her life. While Suzanne was being held at the house with obviously David watching over her, Jeffrey Lee and Anthony Dudson went out to help Michelle's fiancé, Paul Barlow, to help repair his car. Now Paul later said that if they'd have told me there and then, the door would have been kicked down and I would have got Suzanne out. I thought Suzanne was happy in their company and I didn't think they were capable of such savagery. After all, I hardly spent 10 minutes with them in the garage. Now all I want is 10 minutes with them in the back. So if they would have thought that Paul would have been okay with it, they probably would have told him like they were just telling everyone. Seemingly that went around, they told a lot of people. And not those people, again, Jeffrey and Clifford, joined in and then you've got David who just didn't say anything. If they would have told Paul, he would have gone in there and he would have bust her out of there. But they didn't tell him. And yet David did know about it and didn't do anything about it. And it's just devastating that Paul didn't find out. Now, after they helped Paul, they came into contact with Suzanne's stepfather, John. And he asked them if they knew where she was. So he had not seen her in almost a week. He was worried about her. So he asked her friends. She knew she hung out there a lot. They were her friends if they knew whether she was. They obviously replied that they didn't. They hadn't seen her for ages, blah, blah, blah. And that is when he says that he is gonna call the police because and report was missing because he's really worried about her. Yes, she used to stay at theirs a lot and probably he didn't see her very often. However, she probably still contacted him, probably still saw him every now and again. And he's come round and asked her friends if they've seen her and they say no. So obviously, where the heck is she? So he does ring the police and report her as a missing person. This was when they had to change their plans because soon enough the police will be sniffing around. They're gonna look for Suzanne. They're gonna go straight to their house. They're gonna interview them and they didn't want the police snooping around and so they had to do something and that is exactly what they did. In the early hours on the 14th of December of 1992, they shoved Suzanne in the boot of a stolen Fiat Panda and she was driven 15 miles to a narrow lane at Werner Flow near Romley, which was just on the outskirts of Stockport. In the car was Bernie, Jean, Glyn and Anthony and of course Suzanne stuffed in the boot. Bernie apparently giggled as they made their journey. They then dragged Suzanne from the boot of the car and they shoved her down this embankment. Now, the embankment was steep and was full of thorny bushes and nettles. And so as she tumbled down there naked, I believe, she was getting stung, she was getting thorns poked in her all over her body. It was said that at this time, Suzanne's face was peaceful and there were no emotions on her face. This was when Bernadette got down the embankment and she poured petrol all over her. She kicked Suzanne in the face one last time for staring at her before trying to set her on fire. 
She used a taper initially trying to light her on fire, but that didn't work. They then moved on to a scrunched up piece of paper, I believe, trying to set that on fire to light her. Again, that didn't work. Glyn then just took the lighter, put it to her back, lit it, and Suzanne went up in flames. Suzanne screamed as she combusted and they just walked away. So she's lighting up the entire forest with obviously the flames that are licking her skin. And they walk away, they begin to sing Burn Baby Burn. They think she's dead and so they go back to the car and they drive away from the scene, not a care in the world. Apparently they also stop at a shop on the way home to get some canned drinks. Clifford and Jeffrey are waiting for them at the house. When they get in, Cliff asks Glyn, have you done it? To which he replied, yes, and he was laughing. He then gave Cliff his lighter back. The thing was, was after a week, week of torture and then being set on fire, burnt alive, Suzanne didn't actually die like they thought she had. After they left, she managed to scramble back up the hill and she stumbled down the lane for approximately 400 meters to Crumpsall Road. She was found at 6, 10 a.m. by a man named Barry Sutcliffe. Him and his two colleagues were on the way to work in the morning and he stops, he, he stops to help her. He sees a visibly wounded person at the side of the road and they stop. He saw that she had burns all over her body. She told him, and I quote, over there in the field, they burnt me. They put petrol on me. They immediately took her to a nearby house and they frantically alerted the residents, Michael and Margaret Coop, who immediately caught, let them in and called for an ambulance. As they waited for the ambulance, they remember in detail how badly Suzanne was injured. And these are the statements that they gave to the media. Michael Coop said both her hands appeared like ash. Her legs were just like raw meat and her feet appeared badly charred. I was struck by how polite the victim was. She was constantly thanking my wife for her assistance. Margaret Coop said, I instinctively went to put my arms around her, but she pulled away and shrieked in pain. She couldn't bear to be touched. Her head was shaved and there were recent not new cuts to her head. Her face was almost featureless. Her hands were red raw and black at the fingertips and her legs were red from top to bottom. She couldn't bear anything near her legs. Suzanne drank down six full glasses of water, but she couldn't hold them herself because it was just too painful. Margaret Coop went on to say she looked like the victim of a chemical attack in the Vietnam War, but I felt she would survive. I had this theory that now she had got to somewhere she could be helped, she would live. She was rushed to hospital and despite her horrific injuries, she was able to give the names of her six assailants and give them Jean Powell's address, which is absolutely fantastic. They were tending to her injuries and they contact her parents. But the, the extent of the burns were so much, as I said, Margaret said her face was featureless. Well, when her parents actually came, they couldn't recognize their own daughter. Her facial features had just completely gone. She was actually positively identified as being Suzanne by a partial thumbprint, which was a tiny little section of a hand. And it was the only section that wasn't burnt severely enough for them to actually get the fingerprint. And that, as I said, allowed them to positively identify her as Susan Kappa. An investigation was directed by Detective Peter Wall of Greater Manchester Police. On the 14th of December, he instructs officers to go to the house that they have given, that she gave the address, Jean's house, and to arrest everyone that was there, even without an arrest warrant, given the severity and how gruesome and savage the crime was. Whilst being arrested, Jean Powell and Bernadette McNeely just simply laughed and joked with each other about the incident. Initially, all six did deny any involvement in it and they basically tried blaming each other until the point that Anthony Dudson's father compelled him to tell the truth or he could forget his family forever. And following that, Anthony confessed. He confessed to his crimes and they recorded his statement. As the story began to unfold, the officers just couldn't believe it. They kept asking themselves, which I have asked myself, how can anybody do that to a human being? The officers were horrified when they, when the full extent of what has happened to Suzanne was revealed. And they were so off horrified that they actually wept as the true extent of the torture was uncovered. They did a collection at the station for her and they purchased some flowers to be sent to the hospital for her as an apology at failing to protect a citizen. Suzanne would fall into a coma from her injuries. On the 17th of December in 1992, the six accused appeared before magistrates in Manchester. They were all remanded into custody and charged with kidnapping and murder. On the 18th of December in 1992, Suzanne Kappa died in her sleep without ever regaining consciousness from a coma. Following Suzanne's death, 
the group was charged with a murder on the 23rd of December in 1992. The inquest was opened at Manchester Coroner's Court on the 8th of January in 1993. Dr. William Lawler, the pathologist, testified that Suzanne had suffered 75 to 80% burns to her entire body consistent with having had petrol thrown on her and then set on fire, and that a chance of survival had been minimal. He stated it was clear from the onset that Suzanne was unlikely to survive. She suffered widespread burns that led to several complications internally. Her death was due to complications caused by those burns. The trial commenced on the 16th of November in 1993, and it lasted 22 days. All six denied murder, and in their testimony, each defendant tried to minimise their part in this crime. They were just trying to cover their own backs to try and get less and lesser sentences. On the 24th of November, Clifford Pook was cleared of murder. The jury began their deliberations on the 16th of December in 1993, and they took nine hours and 52 minutes to reach the verdicts, which were as follows that I will put up on the screen. Mainly because there's so many of them, that's why it would be easier for you guys and myself to just put an image up of what they received, because there's quite a lot of people involved, and the sentencing that they got was varied. Some of them appealed their sentences, Jeffrey appealed. He was actually reduced from 12 years to 9 years on the 4th of November in 1994. Jeffrey was actually released early from his sentence in 1998, as was Clifford Puck in May of 2001, both on life licenses, whatever that means. In 2002, Anthony's minimum tariff was cut from 18 years to 16 years. He appealed again, but this time it was dismissed on the 21st of November in 2003. How could Anthony have the audacity to appeal his sentence. He fully participated, he fully enjoyed what he was doing, torturing Suzanne, punishing her, and he was there helping to murder her, a 16 year old girl. He should be in prison for the rest of his life. Although he didn't get his appeal, he kind of was granted something because he was then moved to an open prison in 2009. So he kind of got a lot more free reign to say that he participated in this horrific case. Open prisons, they get a lot more freedom, they get... Sometimes they're not locked up in their cells, they don't have to be watched all the time, and they just have a lot more freedom than they would have done. So even though he didn't get his parole, he did get something out of it. It gets worse though, because Bernadette McNeely, remember her? The Chucky killer, as she was dubbed by the media. Well, she was released from prison in December of 2014. And yes, you heard that right. It was apparently due to good behaviour and being a model inmate. However, it was it came out that there was a big scandal and while she was in prison, she had affairs with a lot of people. One of them was the prison governor, Mike Martin. He did eventually resign. A lot of people do actually believe that her sexual relations in there and everything she did, that people believe that she managed to manipulate her way to the top and her way to get out of jail early by just sleeping with everyone. It was also said that she had an affair with two serial killers in there, one of which was Myra Hindley, who, if you do not know, was one of the Moore's murderers. Bernadette now lives under a new identity in a secret location in the northwest of England. I do believe it's well known that her community don't want her, and England basically don't want her. While none of her six attackers should have ever seen the light of day, only Jean Powell, Glyn Powell, and Anthony Dodson remain behind bars today. Suzanne Kappa's murder was one of the most appalling ever committed on British soil, and this brave girl seriously went through hell before she eventually lost a battle. And she was just that. She was a brave, amazing young girl to have been through all of that torture, to be burned alive and to still carry on. To go on, to try and get help, to give her attackers names out. She was just truly astonishing. She must have been in so much pain after being burned and it would have been so easy for her to just give up, but she didn't. She, she went back up that embankment, she found help and she was able to give her attackers names because of it. Suzanne Kappa was truly an amazing young girl and it breaks my heart that she could have been saved and unfortunately wasn't and it's just awful. This case was just truly truly horrific and it totally breaks my heart what she had to go through and what Suzanne's family had to go through and I find it utterly disgraceful that some of them are out. Bernie being one of the worst ones, she's out roaming free and of course that's just my opinion but I just I just, it's awful. I can't lie about that, that's just my opinion again, but that's my thoughts on it. But yeah, that's the end of the case. If you guys have any suggestions, please let me know and I'll look into them for you. Give me a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to watch 
videos of similar content. Anyway guys, that's all I have today on the tragic case of Suzanne Kappa. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, bye.